it's a real privilege to talk about Gold Leaf to an audience of book people because many of you already know something about the use of Gold Leaf as in bookbinding. As a matter of fact, probably some of you have used Gold Leaf. Could we have a show of hands of everybody who has ever used Gold Leaf or even tried to? My, <laughs> what an intrepid group you are. <laughs> Using Gold Leaf is not easy. And one of the things you all learned is how difficult it is to handle because of its extreme thinness. In my opinion, the most fascinating thing about Gold Leaf is its unbelievable thinness. If you made a pile of gold leaves, putting one leaf on top of another, and kept at it until you had 300,000 leaves, the height of your stack would be one inch. If you used the most powerful optical microscope you could find and tried to look at a sheet of gold leaf edge on, you would see nothing because gold leaf is thinner than the wavelength of the visible light. Think about this. A package of paper for your computer printer has about 500 sheets in it and it's an inch and a half thick. So two packages would have a thousand sheets and be three inches thick, which tells us that the paper is about three thousandths of an inch thick. Gold leaf is three millionths of an inch thick. So if you can imagine slicing a sheet of that paper into a thousand layers, each one would be the thickness of gold leaf. So how is it possible to make gold leaf this thin? It's done by beating. And people have been beating gold for thousands of years. This is a painting in an Egyptian tomb dated 1500 BC. This man is beating gold leaf with a stone. Uh, these original pictures were in color, and that circle on the top right uh, was painted bright yellow because it represents the gold he has beaten. Uh, the, the Greeks made gold leaf, the Romans made gold leaf, people have made gold leaf down through the years until today. This is an engraving from the 1763 Diderot Pictorial Encyclopedia of Industry and it shows everything needed to make gold leaf. I am going to describe to you the way we made gold leaf in our factory in about 1940, but it's really hardly any difference than what these people are doing in this picture. First of all, we need some gold. This is a gold brick we bought from the U.S. Mint. You can see from the ruler along the bottom that it's about seven inches long which is slightly smaller than an ordinary household brick. It's stamped with its weight, which is 401.17 troy ounces. And at today's value, that brick would be, it's not very big, but it would be worth about a half a million dollars. Gold is very heavy. Gold is 70% heavier than lead. This not very large brick weighs 27 pounds. It is also stamped with its purity. It's 99.99% .99 fine gold. Gold leaf is not usually made from 24 karat gold. Uh, a little bit of copper and a little bit of silver is added to it to improve the working properties during the beating. And most gold leaf is 23 karat or 96% gold. Uh, this brick was too big for us to handle and we had the mint cut it into four pieces of about 100 ounces each. And here we are, it's time to melt it. One of those 100 ounce pieces of gold and a little copper and silver were put into this sand crucible and put in a furnace. Gold melts at about 2,000 degrees, but gold beaters all believe that if you heat it well above that, it will make better gold leaf. So we heat it to about 2,500 degrees. When I was apprenticing in the factory, my first job was in the melting room. And one day while I was at work, a professional photographer walked in taking pictures for an article on gold leaf. And that's how this picture is me. <laughs> While I was learning the business, I worked in every other department in the factory, but nobody ever took my picture again. The molten gold is then poured into an iron mold and it makes a bar 
about half an inch thick, an inch wide, and a foot long. The bar is then put through rolling mills. The rolling mill has the remarkable property of making the bar thinner and longer, but it does not change its one inch width. After many, many passes through the heavy rolling mills, uh, what's now a ribbon about a sixteenth of an inch thick is put through the finishing rollers also for multiple times and we wind up uh, with a ribbon of gold about the thickness of kitchen aluminum foil and a couple of hundred feet long and uh, still only one inch wide. Okay, now we're ready to start making gold leaf. Here is the process. You see on the left a one inch square of gold cut from that ribbon. This is beaten until it's about five and a half inches square. That piece is cut in quarters and each quarter is beaten until it's five and three quarter inches square. Again it's cut in quarters and beaten until it's almost six inches across. From that little one inch square we have made 16 of these leaves. One ounce of gold will now cover 175 square feet. And from the center of this finished leaf, we cut a three, three and three eighths inch piece, which is the finished leaf that we sell to people. This woman is, uh, oh, I should say, we do not beat directly on the gold. The gold is put between separating sheets. And for this first beating, we use something called vellum, which is a high grade parchment made from calfskin. Uh, at the top left of the table under the box, you can see a stack of vellum sheets, and you can see she is putting a one inch square between each sheet. This first beading is called the cutch. Here are the vellums, and then we have two sleeves of parchment, uh, which we put on to hold the pack together. Here is a pack all ready to be beaten. You will notice on the parchment, there is lettering. And this is one of, the fa one of the endless fascinating things about gold leaf. In the 18th and 19th centuries, legal documents were written on large sheets of parchment. Today, those, those old documents have no value. And we would buy them in 50 pound bales in England and cut them up and make sleeves. So we're ready to start beating. Notice the hammer. The faces of the hammer are not flat. They are slightly convex. And I've always wondered, and not always, I have recently wondered why the hammer has two faces. Maybe one has more or less convectivity. But by the time I got to worrying about that, I don't have any more gold beater's hammers to check. This man is working on a gold beater stand. The stand is made of a 400 pound block of granite, but the granite is not just sitting on the floor. There is a 12 inch in diameter, four foot long oak log set vertically in concrete on which the block of granite stands. And gold beaters say this gives them just the right resiliency for beating gold. When you start to beat, you can't just beat in the center of the packet all the time or you'd get a ring of gold with a hole in it. So gold beaters beat in a pattern. And after they've beaten this pattern, they turn it 90 degrees and beat that pattern again. They start with a very small pattern and as the leaf grows, they make larger and larger patterns. I wish I had a picture of gold beaters at work, but back in the 1940s, people weren't taking movies. I did come across a curious uh, reel of film that was apparently made in our Chicago office in the 1930s by somebody who wanted to study the gold beaters and see if there were slight differences in their technique. So this stupid film <laughs> shows six different gold beaters, each shown from the side and from the front and all in slow motion. But it is kind of interesting. I want you to notice how he's holding the mold. I'm always amazed that gold beaters still had five fingers on their left hand. <laughs> we'll watch this for a minute. You'll notice that the hammer rebounds uh, and 
Between the rebound and the upward momentum, it's not as hard to lift the hammer as you might think. The goal beater puts energy into the downstroke, and goal beaters are not the muscular people you might think, but sometimes rather small men, wiry guys, uh, who've been at it for years and years. So, uh, the first beating is beaten for 15 minutes with a 16 pound hammer. The second beating, which is called the shoulder, S-H-O-D-E-R, is beaten for two hours with a nine pound hammer. And the third beating, which is called the mold, M-O-U-L-D, is also beaten for two hours, but only with a six pound hammer. Now we have to cut this first piece up into quarters. And the tool we use to do it, which she has in her right hand, is called a wagon. In England, they call it a sled, which would probably be a better name. But like everything else in gold leaf, the, ed the cutting edge on that wagon is not a steel blade. It is a piece of malacca reed. And we would buy this reed, cut it up into six inch lengths, split it into five or six pieces, and set it into the wagon so that the hard outer edge of the, uh, of the reed was the cutting edge, which you would then sharpen with a knife. And properly sharpened, it would last for quite a while, and then you have to sharpen it again. Gold beaters say that this is vastly superior to a steel blade, firstly because the gold doesn't stick to it as it might to a steel blade, secondly because uh, the reed does not cut through the leather cushion on which they're working, which a steel blade might do. Uh, and so she cuts this into quarters, and then she puts it into sheets for the second beating, which, as I said, is called the shoulder. We do not use vellum for the shoulder. We use something called gold beater skin, which is also used for the third beating, and I will talk a little later about gold beater skin. So there's the second beating, cut into quarters, beat into the third leaf. That last beating is very tricky because if you beat it to a uniform thickness all over, it would be so thin that the edges would break up. So the beater, believe it or not, beats that leaf so it's a uniform thickness throughout the center, but the edge is heavier so that it doesn't break up. This is one of the reasons it took 10 years as an apprentice to learn to be a gold beater. And then the center is cut out to make the uh, final leaf, and the heavy edge is discarded and reused as gold. Uh, this woman is cutting the final leaf out of the center, and then she puts it in books of tissue paper, which has been coated with rouge so the gold doesn't stick to it. There are 25 leaves in a book, and this woman is inspecting the finished packages. Gold leaf is usually sold in a box containing 20 books of 25 leaves each. It's called a pack and it contains 500 leaves. Cutting and filling was a highly skilled job. Uh, it's paid by piece time, piece rate, so you better learn what you're doing. It took about a year to learn. We had a custom in our factory that young women would come in and learn this and then they would get married and have children. And after a few years, they would take to coming into the factory uh, every week or two and picking up another mold that be needed to be cut and some empty books. And then they would bring them back in, trade in the books and get another mold. And then when their kids had grown up and gone, they would come back in the factory and work in the factory. Let's go back to this engraving I showed you. Uh, now that you know how gold leaf is made, you can see the furnace on the left, and I like the bellows he has uh, up in his left hand to make a very hot fire. On the floor in front of the furnace is the ingot in which the gold will be poured. Uh, the women on the right are the cutters and fillers. In the middle is the rolling mill, and there in the center is the gold beater. I find it fascinating that he's sitting down because all the gold beaters I have ever seen do their work standing up. Now I said I would talk about gold beater skin. This is really unique. I don't have any pictures of this, but that's probably just as well. 
because gold beater skin is made from the lower intest intestine of an ox. Uh, these are split open to make a sheet about eight inches wide and about three feet long, and they're stretched on wooden frames. What was once the inside of the intestine is shiny. What was the outside has a lot of flesh attached to it, which is all cleaned off with pumice stone and lots and lots of water. And then two of these skins, still wet, are placed together with what, what was had the flesh sides together, and they bond into one sheet, which is shiny on both sides and about a thousandth of an inch thick and very strong. But we haven't finished making gold beater skin yet. We now have to coat it with a coating called the ground. Every maker of gold beater skin had his own formula for the ground. Uh, most of them contained gum arabic uh, because it is hygroscopic, it absorbs moisture, and during the beating, the beating heats up the mold and the gum arabic gives off moisture which lifts the gold off the gold beater skin. Uh, there was one gold be one manufacturer of gold beater skin in England called Puckridge, who somehow, I guess his ground coating was better than anybody else's, but everybody agreed you could make better gold leaf with a Puckridge mold than anybody else's. And by 1900, practically all gold beaters in England and the United States were using Puckridge molds. I said nothing has really changed since 1763, but here's an exception. Gold beater skins are no longer made from ox intestines. They're made from mylar. And another change is that most gold leaf today is not beaten by hand, it's beaten by machine. And every gold beating company invented their own machine. Here's the machine that we invented in the 1920s. It's not very hard to make a machine that has a hammer that goes up and down, but you need some kind of an arrangement to move the the mold around underneath it in a pattern like I showed you so that they get finished leaf. So the mold is held in a circular frame and on the back of the hammer is a cam and as that cam rotates it pushes the frame forward and then periodically as you can see the cam lets it drop back and with every blow of the hammer uh, the frame is rotated slightly, so you get a nice pattern. And you can see on the floor uh, cams of different sizes because periodically they have to be changed. You could teach somebody in a fairly short time to run one of these hammers, but it still takes an experienced gold beater to know when to change the cams. And I should also add the last 15 minutes of the final gold beating is still done by hand because it's so delicate. Now let's talk about the uses of gold leaf. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, far and away the largest use of gold leaf was for signs. This is the ticket office of the Louisville and Nashville Railroad in Memphis in 1888. All the lettering on the windows is gold leaf. This is a sales office in Michigan that would like to sell you land in the upper Michigan Peninsula. And once again, all the lettering is in gold. Uh, gold leaf is used in many ways. This is a fancy restaurant in New York. You can use gold leaf on billboards. You probably won't be very impressed by this one until I tell you that those letters are five feet high and they're solid gold leaf. A lot of things have changed in signs. There are neon signs, metal letters, plastic letters. The whole fashion for the design of a sign is different, and very few people make gold signs anymore out of gold leaf. Uh, fortunately, we still have a number of sign painters uh, who will do a gold sign for you. This elegant little sign was done by uh, Andrew Livingston, who is sitting among you in the room. Andrew, put your hand up. If you need a nice gold leaf sign, there's your man. Um, so there is very little 
gold leaf sold for signs anymore. The second biggest use for gold leaf was in bookbinding. When I was 12 years old, my grandmother gave me a beautiful little New Testament Bible. It was bound in leather and stamped in gold, and all three sides were edge gilded, and it was a pleasure just to hold it in your hands. But books like that are not made anymore. At least I haven't seen them in Barnes and Noble. <laughs> and if you do find gold stamping on a book, it's not gold. Today, it's done with aluminum with a clear yellow lacquer to make it look like gold. There is one use for gold leaf for which there is no substitute, and that is gilding on buildings and statues. This is the Capitol Dome of the state of Georgia in Atlanta. The building was built in the, in the 1890s, and the dome was originally tin, but when they uh, rehabbed the building in 1960, they said we should really do that dome in gold because Georgians are very proud of the fact that they had a gold rush in 1828. Over the next few years, 900,000 ounces came out of the land in Georgia. So they said not only should we make the dome of gold, but it should be Georgia gold. So they went out and did a little bit more mining and panning, and they asked people to contribute gold. And the gold was sent to a refiner in, in Hartford, Connecticut, and then to us to be made into gold leaf, and was finally put on the dome. This dome required 8,000 square feet of gold leaf. There are 10 states that have gold capital domes in this country. Somewhat surprisingly, our gorgeous Capitol building in Sacramento has a copper dome. Uh, but I guess we don't really need to boast. Everybody in the world knows that California is the golden state. Uh, this is our San Francisco City Hall. And the, all, the dec all the gold decorations on that were recently redone, and it really looks great. Here is Joan of Arc in Philadelphia. This statue was cast in 1890 in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution, and it stood in Philadelphia until 1960 when they decided to gild it. And in 1960, she looked like this. 60 years later, she wasn't this shiny, but she still had a warm golden glow to her, but the pedestal under her needed repair, so they had to take her down in order to the, restore the pedestal and they took the opportunity to regild her, and I think she looks great. We were in Paris a dozen years ago, and the Parisians had, had gone crazy gilding everything they could find except the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> they gilded statues everywhere they could find them, on the tops of buildings, even on bridges. And there really is no substitute for gold leaf in this kind of work. Uh, in, 19, in the 1920s, there was an insurance company that built a very handsome building in Philadelphia with a long front that had elaborate gold leaf decoration on it. By, by now, the insurance company's long gone, and the building was rehabbed into office space for rent, and while they were at it, they redid all the gold decoration. But they did it with gold paint. Gold paint is made from bronze powder, and it will tarnish. And today, all those gold decorations look like a dirty gray color. Gold leaf is also used in jewelry and in art. Uh, this this uh, necklace has gold leaf on every ball. Don't ask me how they ever managed to apply it, uh, but I think it's very handsome. Christy and I bought this in the Victoria and Albert Museum. It's nothing but a piece of plexiglass with a little bit of gold leaf on it, but every time Christy wears it, she gets all kinds of compliments. This is not a very good picture because it was the best I could do scanning it from a New York Times article, but the story behind the picture is kind of interesting. 
an artist in Amsterdam decided to do all the lettering on the side of the box in gold leaf. Now, I would think that was a stupid waste of his time, but it transformed, into the, it transformed the box into an object of contemporary art, and he sold the box for $30,000. <laughs> in 1947, our company's three biggest customers were the Pennsylvania Railroad, the Stetson Hat Company, and the Allied Kid Company. The Pennsylvania Railroad put five gold leaf stripes on each side of its new electric locomotives, and they put one gold leaf stripe the full length of each side of every passenger car. They used a lot of gold leaf, but I don't need to tell you what happened to railroads, so that's not much of a market anymore. The Stetson Hat Company, uh, every Stetson hat had a silk liner that was stamped with an elaborate gold leaf design. Uh, they had a huge factory in North Philadelphia. And one day I was sent to make a delivery to them and they told me to be sure and wear a cap because Stetson would not accept deliveries from a delivery man who didn't, something, didn't have something on his head. Today the Stetson factory is an empty shell because men don't wear hats anymore. Well, that's not strictly true. Some of them like to wear baseball caps with a visor backwards, but that doesn't help the gold leaf business. <laughs> Our third largest customer was the Allied Kid Company, who made gold leaf for shoes and handbags and belts. During the war, women's fashion was pretty drab, and after the war, everybody wanted to look, to look as elegant as they could, and there was a big demand for gold shoes and bags and belts. You would even see shop girls on the subway wearing gold shoes to work. And we sold them a lot of gold leaf, but fashions don't last too long, and so that was the end of that business. You can still buy gold leather for a handbag or a shoe, but like the book stampings, it is not gold, it is aluminum colored to look like gold. In the 1930s, we had three, 300 employees making gold leaf. By 1968, we were down to a couple of dozen, and we finally decided to stop making gold leaf. Gold leaf is still made uh, in Germany and in Italy. In Germany, for the last 200 years, all the gold leaf made in Germany is made in the town of Furt, near Nuremberg. And in Italy, all the gold leaf is made in, in Florence by a town called, Man by a company called Manetti, which is at least 100 years old. On the other side of the world, gold leaf is made in Japan. And once again, it's all made in the same town of Kanazawa on the west side of the main island of Honshu. Kanazawa also has a very famous Japanese garden, so it gets a lot of tourists. And one of the gold leaf companies invites you to come in and see how gold leaf is made. Uh, they make a very good quality of leaf. Uh, they use essentially the same way we do, but they don't use gold beater skin. They use a specially made paper, which like a lot of Japanese paper is made out of rice. Uh, interesting enough, most of the gold leaf in Kanazawa is used in Kanazawa. There are a number of companies making gold screens, which are often covered with gold leaf. And there is also quite an industry uh, making lacquerware. And the lacquerware is often covered with gold. Here's a gold plate, a lacquerware gold plate covered with gold, a teacup, a box, all kinds of shapes. And of course, we can't leave Japan without having a look at the most famous gold building in Japan, the Gold Pavilion in Kyoto. Moving on, here we are in Burma, the land of a thousand temples, uh, most of whose spires are gilded with gold leaf. Burma has always been uh, pretty much isolated, and they had, had to invent gold leaf gold beading for themselves. Like the Japanese, they don't use gold beater skin, 
They use a special paper, but their paper is made out of bamboo. They use a kind of bamboo that is not hollow, but has lots of fibers on the inside. They cut it into lengths between the, the nodes, split them open, put them in huge jugs of water, and seal them up for three to six years. I'm not going to describe the rest of the process because it's too complicated. There were two American paper makers who made three separate trips to Burma to study how this paper was made, and the book they wrote describes 19 separate steps in making the paper. And then there's the gold beating. They had to invent gold beating. And if someone had told me 20 years ago how they did their gold beating, I would not have believed them. I would have thought they were making it up. But nowadays, tourists travel with video cameras and they put the results on YouTube. So I'm not going to tell you how the Burmese beat the gold. I'm going to show you. It's utterly fantastic. I don't think they make a very good quality of gold because there's no way these guys could place their blows as carefully as Western gold beaters do. But they're not trying to make the kind of gold leaf we are. Most of the gold leaf they sell is in little packets of 10 pieces of gold leaf, about an inch and a half square, which the faithful buy to apply to statues of Buddha and other important things, which is what keeps them so gold in China. And now we'll go to Portugal. We were in Lisbon a few years ago, and we visited an institution that teaches old-time crafts, like cabinet making and wood carving and marquetry and bronze casting and, of course, bookbinding. They had the most fantastic collection of tools for embossing books I have ever seen. Every one of these tools has a different design on the end of it. They also had a gold beater. And Christy and I were taken to see the gold beater. And there she is. Her name is Fernanda, and she learned the trade from her father. And in her little shop, she does the entire process. Uh, behind her left elbow, you can see her little furnace. The round object is the lid of the furnace, which is open. And you can see the sand crucible sitting on the edge of the furnace. She has a rolling mill, which I unfortunately didn't photograph. In this box or are the vellum and the gold beater skin. And this is her hammer, which I found fascinating to have only one face. So I was really blown away by this. I think Fernandina may be the only woman gold beater ever to set foot on this earth. <laughs> and now I'm going to show you that it has nothing to do with gold leaf at all. But since you're all big book people, and since you know that folks like to use their computers to design new typefaces, one day when I was Googling the name Hastings, I came up with somebody who had come up with a typeface named Hastings Gold. And here's his ad. He had come across a box of Hastings Gold Leaf, and he liked the lettering of Hastings and Company. And he designed an entire font, uppercase and lowercase, in the style of Hastings and Company. I found it fascinating because this box was designed in the 1860s, and over the next hundred years, we never changed it. But the idea that somebody who had hand designed a typeface in 1860, a hundred years later, somebody would use it, be using a computer to design a font. Here's what it looks like. I don't know about you, but I don't think it's very interesting and not worth all the effort. <laughs> Last summer, Christy was going through the garage cleaning up, and she came across a roll of eight millimeter film that was labeled gold beating. So we had it digitized, and it turned out to have been made probably in the 1940s by a gold leaf company in New York called Kemp for the purpose of showing the entire process of making gold leaf. It's rather well done, and I thought it would be a fitting end to my talk. So here it is, and I hope you enjoy it.
No, I don't know how many atoms thick. I will tell you something very interesting. It would seem there should be a better way in this modern age to make gold leaf. Uh, we tried this. Uh, we had a vacuum chamber that creates a gold vapor, and we allowed the gold vapor to condense on a piece of acetate film. And then we dissolved the acetate film, and you'd think you'd get gold leaf. Even if the amount of gold we put on there is three times what gold leaf is, it just falls away into powder. There is something about the be beating that puts a grain structure into the gold that makes it hold together. Gold will dissolve in mercury. And in the old days, the way you gilded a statue was to paint it with an amalgam of gold and mercury and then heat it to drive off the mercury and you're left with the gold. And if you can think of anything more unhealthy than that. <laughs> Actually, you can't measure anything this thin, but there's another way of discovering it. Uh, gold beating is done in lots. We started off with that 100 ounces of gold, carefully weighed. Uh, and during the process, any broken leaves or other scrap is saved. And at the very end, all of the heavy outside edges that are cut off are saved. And all the scrap gold is weighed and subtracted from the starting weight so we know exactly how much gold we use. We also know exactly how many books of gold leaf we made so we can figure out uh, what the gold content is of each book. And this is a very important thing to gold beaters. It's called the fit. And if the fit is a little bit more, if the fit number is a little bit more than it should be, uh, the beating process is changed to make the leaf a little bit thinner in subsequent beatings. And if the fit number is too, too small, uh, the beating is changed to make it a little thicker. So that's in a very important part of quality control. But it also means that we know exactly how much gold is used from each ounce. As I told you, it's 175 square feet per ounce. And since we know the density of gold, it's easy to calculate the thickness. I don't know. I should say, not very much, because the reason for making gold leaf is uh, that you can cover a large area without using very much gold. So uh, I would say that uh, as a generalized rule, uh, the value of gold in gold leaf compared to the cost of making the gold leaf is about equal. Back in those days, uh, a book of gold leaf sold for about $2. Today it's like 40 I'm going to use your question to say a little bit more. Uh, during all the time I was there, uh, the country was on the gold standard, and gold cost $35 an ounce. And that was a big advantage within many businesses. You have to worry about the variations in your cost of raw material. But it only cost us $35 an ounce. That's what we knew it was going to cost us. Yes, we had a license to use gold, and we bought it from the Mint. And no, I don't remember anybody ever coming in and inspecting us. First of all, the gold <coughs> leaf is held on uh, by something called gold size. If any of you have ever painted your boat, you, the, the varnish you use on a boat has a lot of oil in it and it seems to never dry. And if you put even more oil in it, you make a long oil gold, varn gold size. And that is painted on a section of the, of the building. And it has to be left overnight to dry to the proper point of tackiness. And then you put on single sheets of gold, gold leaf. Of course, if it's a little windy, that's kind of hard to do. <laughs> so uh, one of the things we sold, we would, we would take squares of tissue paper and lay a square of gold on it and press it together so the gold leaf was held on the tissue paper. And you would lay that onto the size and peel the tissue paper away. Uh, no, there's really only one quality of gold leaf except the very, very best gold leaf is called glass gold, and it's used for like that little sign I showed you, gilding on glass. A, no, there was no OSHA. B, everybody was very careful. And C, I don't know of anybody 
as I said earlier, I don't know of anybody with any gold beaters with le fewer than five fingers on their left hand. Not that I know of. Uh, in, in Europe, they do it to a size that is approximately the same, but it's based on millimeters. Yes, there are Egyptian mummies, and they used to put gold leaf on the mummy cases, and sometimes they would put it on the mummy itself, and if you go to the British Museum, you can see those. Good question. I don't know how often we replace the vellum, but the gold beater skin could be used for probably a hundred or more beatings, and then it was not quite as good quality, so instead of using it for the mold, which was the last stage of beating, it was used for the shoulder, which is the second stage of beating. I guess that's it. You're a very attentive audience. Thank you.